Hey, women's hockey fans, welcome to another episode of the Founding Four podcast. As you know, the Founding Four gets its name from the original National Women's Hockey League teams, the Founding Four. That's where it comes from. Yes, yes. But we cover all of women's hockey. If this is your first time tuning in, I am your host, Erica Lindsay Ayala, and thank you for listening. Whether it's your first time or your 50th time, I'm excited for the Founding Four podcast. We have a good one. This episode, we are joined by the interim commissioner of the NWHL, Ty Timinia. And so I'm going to send you over to that in just a minute. And if you're not a subscriber to the Nine newsletter, there's a, a bunch of news and I broke all of that down for the nine uh, this hockey Friday. Um, but I'll give you a little bit of a taste. But after my interview with Ty Timinia, um, you'll hear Ty and I talk about COVID-19. I do want to offer an update. Um, the state of Massachusetts has shut down um, hockey rinks through an executive order. And um, the executive order is not supposed to impact college and professional teams. Um, So I did want to reach out to the league and to the Boston Pride just to see if there are any changes. In reaching out to the Boston Pride, I found out that, yes, the next practice for the Boston Pride is scheduled uh, for Monday. Um, The executive order is a stay through November 7th. So the Boston Pride are planning to... Uh, return to their activities and their training Um, and they're not anticipating that there will be any changes at this moment that they will continue to follow strict protocols um, during team workouts Um, they're making sure that they are safe prioritizing of course the health of the players and staff Titamini and I talk about everything from expansion to finding four owners to the board of governors structure and of course the impact of COVID-19 on season six. Here's my interview with Ty Timinia. We'll start from the beginning and you and I kind of already talked about this uh, briefly in passing, but um, I'd love to start Ty just with, with your, um, your introduction to, to women's hockey and the NWHL in particular. Obviously you have such a, a wealth of knowledge and experience when it comes to professional sports, but uh, love to know what are your, what's your hockey story, your hockey origin story? So I, you know, so I come from minor league baseball. I come from a baseball family, right? I grew up in baseball. Um, it's, I'm, it's kind of boring if I if I say it out loud. I I grew up in baseball. I worked in baseball. I married into baseball. So I mean, it's just all around kind of boring, I guess. But um, yeah. So my my experience is in minor league baseball. My group owns six minor league teams, six different states mirrors um a lot with what's going on with the nwhl we have six teams right six different areas um and so really on the sports operation and sports marketing um some player development i am i went to a major league baseball scout school um and there was two two women there out of 65 so um yeah that was that was fun so I really felt uh, that I needed to go to scout school because one of our clubs um, in, that I own in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, um, I, I, one of my jobs was tasked with developing a roster there, right? So um, I got a chance to get it, uh, in with some college coaches, help develop that roster a little bit. And then on the affiliated side, you know, we have to deal with the major league clubs um, uh, in minor league baseball. So I think scouting and player development played a huge part in that. Um, uh, relationship so yeah so um, the that world and now we're jumping into um, hockey uh, but as I was looking in the next stages of my life Erica candidly I've got two little girls um, and they love hockey and and for me it's about a woman's movement right it's about um, how I can help a marginalized community and and how I can be a part of that. So although I love my baseball, right? Um, I certainly love and I'm excited about this new next chapter. Um, and that is what appealed to me when it came to the role initially as chairman of Toronto Six. Um, it was something I feel very passionate about. It's something that I want to help um, as my two little girls become women. 
um, and I hope they become strong, independent, and confident women. And I think not only could I serve as a role model in my house, right, at home with them, but how can I elevate the game and attention and be a part of that, collaborate with a lot of people. And so that's what's exciting to me um, about hockey right now. Um, there's some, some room to go. Um, but this is an awesome time for women's sports. And um, I want to be part of that movement for sure. That is so exciting to hear. And I am not going to let you off of this call without talking about the World Series. I'm a huge baseball fan myself. Oh, yeah. so we got to get some predictions. So I'll, I'll give you a minute to think about that. But, uh, um, you know, what you said about empowering the next generation of women for the sake of, of your family, for your daughters. I think a lot of people come to women's sports, um, girls and women's sports through that lens. But I also would love to, to bend your ear as far as when it comes to someone who's been in operations, uh, who's been in ownership, um, where do you see the, the potential um, or where, how do you hope to impact the, the potential that women's hockey has right now? So I will say um, my success was around a group um, that had uh, the same methodology and philosophy um, in that ownership group in baseball. I, I will echo and say that uh, another reason why I wanted to be part of this group was that you really have some true genuine backers here that are, you know, um, in this league. Um, as the model has changed a little bit, there's been some infusion of, of some independent owners who understand what we're trying to do. And that's very important to the sustainability of women's hockey or women's sport um, is the backing. And, and, and true backing, like sponsorship, um, broadcast, um, all the operational aspects that need to go um, and be choreographed for success. Um, so it's kind of like what I was talking about earlier is that um, the foundation of that in order to take it to the next level, and especially with the way that we've structured now, um, the way that this league is going to present itself, um, is really hopefully showing outside as well as internally um, with our staff that you know you do need backing that's the way of the world um, you need resources and if you've got committed people that truly want to commit to that um, that is where you're gonna where you're gonna say operationally um, so for the board of governors in particular um, why this model how is it different now um, than it was in the last you know five years is it mirrors a lot of what is already going on in, in higher level leagues and, and sport, right? So you have this board of governors now that we've instituted and they're really the ruling and governing body of the NWHL. So you have each teams, right? And they're the members of the league. And so the members are then appointed a governor. So, so the member of the team will appoint a governor. So now what you're doing right off the bat is infusing new leadership. We're, we're at, we have a huge presence on uh, the board, has a huge presence with ruling and governing now, but you're elevating the level of operation and administration right out of the gate. So yes, there's a lot of protocols and checks and balances now, um, but I think what happens with that, it's necessary to define um, and elevate a level of professionalism so that we're bridging and building gaps between us, stakeholders in, in the sports world, and then sponsorships. Um, and it's necessary when you're trying to elevate the sponsorship and broadcast aspect of it too, right? Um, that's a long, long version of, of, of an answer to your question, but. Um, yeah, I love that. And I wanna stay there for a little bit because again, fans that have been following the NWHL or even truly women's hockey, this is a new model to how we've seen anything in women's hockey done before. And there are not very many women's sports leagues, quite honestly, that, that follow this model. So it sounds as though the, the six uh, governors, that each represents one of the six now NWHL teams. And my understanding is that that differs because prior to um, you coming in as interim commissioner, all of what six people are doing now would have fallen on the shoulders of Danny Ryland as commissioner of the overall league. Right. 
And it was almost like one voice. You had to look at it like that. So now, um, I mean, <laughs> I've got six different bosses, if you, gotta, if, you, if you think about it, right? So I always laugh. My dad always says, you know, Ty, you got to simplify your life. <laughs> okay. And now I've just added a whole bunch of bosses. So, um, but it's necessary because um, the way that the model is going to be structured, which I think from a fan perspective is quite exciting. Um, you you want to almost eliminate the one voice from the six teams, from a fan base. Fans, I feel very passionate, they're very passionate. But from a community aspect, you really want to create from the marketing aspect, the voice of the club, a real tribal effect in that community. That's what's going to be successful in those markets. And, and what you're going to find now with individual owners coming through is you're going to get some customization. You're going to get some different voices. You're going to get some, it's going to be different we're not, not going across the one paintbrush, right, um, across the league. And, and yes, like typical leagues and, 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 and teams in other sports, there's going to be a competitive edge now, right? Like, so some resources might be available to some clubs that you might not see with other clubs. But I think that's all um, beneficial to the unique fabric of what we're trying to create going forward, um, if that makes sense. We will get back to my interview with Ty Timinia in just a minute, but I wanted to take this time to let you know about Sports Talk ELA. That is this uh, very organic, I know NWHL fans like that word, but it's a very organic um, women's sports network that I am in the process of building. It's definitely put together with, I don't even think we can afford duct tape. We're, we're still rolling with the, with the scotch tape and masking tape, but it's definitely done with a lot of passion and love. And I want to thank those of you who are following the Founding 4 Pod at Founding 4 Pod on Twitter. And I want to thank those who are um, inaugural members of the Patreon posse, as I like to say. Sports Talk ELA has a Patreon page, and there have been some uh, fantastic, dedicated fans. I thank you from the bottom of my heart um, because you've given me the confidence and the resources to continue to get better at my craft and to expand women's hockey coverage, but as well as my women's sports coverage. So you'll find the link in the description. If you're not already a member of the squad of the Patreon posse, go ahead and do that. And um, you'll see for those who've been on the page before that there is now an option to pay up front and become uh, and buy into an annual membership. So if that's appealing to you and if you like really nice Founding 4 Pod stickers like I do, Patreon's the place to go. All right, let's get back to this interview. With yeah, it Ty makes total Timinia. sense. And that leads me into something else about this, this structure, especially um, in these first several months. As you well know, uh, two of the teams um, were owned – uh, privately. Um, so two of the six teams, the Boston Pride being one of them, and of course the Toronto Six being the other. And so when you talk about that competitive edge, um, you know, one might argue that those two teams perhaps are positioned to um, kind of take on that, as you said, um, you know, unique and strategic um, way of going about business because they already had an owner. Um, so I do wonder in, in your role and, and with the Board of Governors, you know, what are the ways that the league is maybe trying to bring the other four teams up to speed? Or are there certain things that will kind of carry over from the old model just for now? I mean, how, how, what does that transition, I guess, look like? Yeah, so first is, you know, in, in my role, as, 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 as I think in eight days that I've, I've been tasked with this, um, there's a lot of an evaluation period that has to go on first. So um, as, we, as we build out um, on, on what that looks like going forward, um, there's going to have to be some institutions of um, a league front um, when new owners come, come in. Um, yeah, Toronto and, 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 and Boston um, have 
those independent owners. And we've been, uh, thankfully, prior to me being on uh, task with the interim commissioner role, been working. They were working out levels of what that structure would would look like for for, for new people coming in. But um, you know, like there's going to be you know, so like you have the the league, and then you have the players um, association, right? And then you have the independent owned team. So there's going to have to be a map that gets laid out as from a communication standpoint, from bylaws and governance standpoint, um, that will orchestrate as we go through this. But um, yeah, it's just more of a, it's, it's just more of a checks and balance kind of thing. So. Gotcha. And of course, in a quote unquote normal uh, time period or normal circumstances, the NWHL might very well be into its season uh, about roughly the, the first week or so. But of course, we, uh, we all know that that has not happened. 2020 um, brought us an unprecedented for this generation pandemic that everyone is adapting to. And so the NWHL is not in operations right now. Um, so on the one hand, it seems like the that kind of organizational flow chart and structure that you're talking about, there is time, there is some time um, to develop that. But um, it has been announced um, that the season is projected to start in January 2021. So given uh, that there's some structural yeah. things that need to happen, given that, you know, we, we still as, as a world community are evaluating the impacts of coronavirus, you know, Ty, as of right now, would you say eight days into your interim commissioner role? Um, you know, what updates uh, would you offer when it comes to um, being on track for season six and, and what uh, the league is considering when it comes to just safety, let alone uh, starting up the season? Yeah, great question. So um, I'll give you my short term and long term goals here, right? My immediate goals is we have athletes on ice. Athletes are literally practicing. We've got our rosters filled, and now we don't have a schedule. Um, so in in an insane amount of time, I've got to figure out what does season six really look like. Um, I could tell you um, myself and the board are working really hard um, behind the scenes in, very, in a very quick fashion to come up with what season six does look like. But our main priority right now um, in, in talking about alternatives and talking about where we're, where our lines are, our goal is for season six. It's really safety and, and health concerns. Um, it's a weird time even to take on a leadership challenge role, right? Like there's only so much I can do um, over Zoom. And then also number two, like I'm coming into a massive pandemic. Um, there's so much risk involved and I certainly don't want to put our athletes in jeopardy. Um, no one does. Our coaching staff, I mean, they're, they're um, so important to the sustainability of the leagues. So uh, we're trying really, really hard on um, and burning the midnight oil to try to figure out um, what, what we could do to, for our fans to get some kind of semblance of a season six. Um, I, will, I will promise you on this um, that, uh, and your fans and, and our fans as well that um, we are really trying to def to get something of a season six, um, unless we get shut down, of course, and CDC says, you know, nobody's playing. But I can assure you that uh, we're working to have some kind of a season. Yeah, of course, fans are excited on one hand to hear that, but of course want to be supportive of, of the health and safety of all involved. Um, one other thing, uh, COVID, perhaps COVID related, um, but this is the first season that the NWHL will have a team north of the, the, the border, so to speak. And so we're not just looking at expansion to the Midwest when the Minnesota Whitecaps joined up, uh, formerly an independent team, but now the Toronto Six and Digit Murphy, who we talked about offline just a moment ago, Go now serving as the first head coach for that franchise. Um, are there any challenges, unique challenges that that brings? Or are there any opportunities perhaps that having the six in the league bring at this time? Sure. So there's challenges on multiple levels. So for Digit um, in particular, so she when she's now in Toronto but had a quarantine for 14 days prior to um, hitting the ice, I think yesterday or the day before was her first time on practice, right? And we all know Digit, she's got a, a huge personality, right? So trying to quarantine that for 14 days is, is, is 
I try to roll a time oh, with Gretchen, so she, I, she I just had an image that. and that's hilarious. Right? Think about that. <laughs> uh, she's the best. But um, so yeah, that presents the challenges on, on, on the coach staff, right? In, in front office going over. Um, she's got a huge roster based of Canadians. So um, they have their set of protocols where they get tested every week. Um, but we didn't really have to cross borders um, with an athlete. So that has been helpful. Um, but even practices look challenging. So if you get very tactical on what COVID looks like for them, um, there's only a certain amount of women that can go on the ice. Um, and so they've gotten creative, right? With utilizing outside the rink, literally, and utilizing inside the rink so that we can get um, our, our numbers in there. So that presents a challenge. And then, you know, of course, coming in um, with, you know, the visas and work visas and, and stuff like that um, for a season six, that's what we're in the thick of right now. Um, we're trying to figure out how um, we can get athletes over, um, but it's really going back, you know, because they have to quarantine on, on the exit. Um, so there's, again, there's so many different things and levels that you never, I didn't have to worry about, right, prior to this, prior, like, like many people right now, operationally, didn't have to have this as a factor. And, and you know, there's a, there's a learning curve here. Um, never really had to deal with this before. So um, we were definitely internally just trying to help some patients as we maneuver and try to educate ourselves on how this really looks. Yeah, and you've alluded to it a few times, and a question that I love to ask Anya is kind of, you know, what's on the big board of things to do, uh, or in roles like you have, like a commissioner or a, a leadership role, executive role, a lot of times that's kind of measured in the first 90 days, that first three months. Um, so yeah. again, it, <laughs> all of the things in the air, they're all in the air still, but if, if, you, um, if you had to kind of categorize what you hope to accomplish in in the next several uh, months here in this role you know what's at the top of that list oh, so the top definitely is defining season six then let's broad scale it right let's see like pie in the sky stuff um, I need to figure out uh, what broadcast or linear coverage that this that this league can can garner um, I've got to take a deep dive into the national sponsorship and what that looks like for the league and developing some true partners. Um, I've got to build some kind of relationships, right, with some key stakeholders outside of this league. Um, but in, in long term, on my whiteboard, um, there's some, some uh, protocol stuff that you need to develop internally that we don't have, right? So for Anya, CBA, um, some player bylaws, um, really kind of just making the league whole um, um, and, and defining what that relationship looks like as we go forward. Um, and the other thing that we need to talk about is, which is huge for the league itself, is what does expansion look like? What does growth look like? Um, no secret that I would definitely love to expand um, in Canada. Um, definitely like to grow some markets in the U.S., um, would definitely like to get Minnesota some, some competition. Um, so yeah, those are all things that need to happen. Um, I give a hundred day plan. So I get, I got 10 more days on that 90. So, um, there's a lot of elements that are huge, um, strategic asks. Um, but if we do it the right way with the backing of the board, um, I think we'll, we'll see some, some good stuff and some, you know, we got to get, um, Danny's been tasked with with selling the rest of the remaining four clubs um, and with input in the league and and I think you know we can we can start moving and make it some news here hopefully in the, in the next couple of months that fans can get excited about. All right. I love that. And, you know, you talked about Danny Ryland Kearney now, um, who was the, the founder, is the founder and was the, the commissioner for the last five seasons. Um, and that her role will be to find owners um, for those other four. So that does beg the question. I mean, have there been some owners that uh, have, have shown interest? And do you Yeah. So I'm going to say, I, I mean, look, when you have news like this, it's a natural, uh, you get, you do get a flux of people just because they read about changes, naturally go, oh, hey, what, what does this market look like? I want to, I have some interest. So we, we've had some 
um, immediate interest in a couple of the clubs. Um, and then, um, so I think that helps. Um, once you kind of broadcast that they're for sale, um, I think that, you know, always would help the league. So, yeah, we do have some some interesting stuff. Um, I wouldn't say anything, you know, um, real real close yet, but um, but definitely some interest. All right. Ty Timinia says there is some interest in the four remaining NWHL teams that are not tied to a private owner. But sounds like we're going to have to wait at least a little bit to see if any of those inquiries turn into ownership. Um, But I wanted to pause again to just let you know about the Nine Newsletter. Uh, The Nine Newsletter is a subscription-based model where we cover five women's sports across the five days of the work week. On Monday, we have women's soccer tennis Tuesdays, women's basketball Wednesdays, golf on Thursdays, and I am holding up the rear, closing down the week with hockey Fridays. The interview that you're listening to right now was featured in part, we have a segment called Five at the Nine, where it's a Q&A with someone who is in the women's hockey space. We've uh, talked to people like Megan Duggan, who just retired from USA Hockey, uh, Digit Murphy, who is just named as Toronto Six head coach, first one ever in franchise history, and etc. So a lot of really great names. You're not going to want to miss that. Subscribe to the Nine newsletter and you get one edition of the Nine free and directly to your inbox. So you can sign up for a free subscription or you can join us along the journey and support comprehensive women's sports coverage. So link in the description, but follow us at the Nine as in Title Nine newsletter on social media. I look forward to uh, talking some Hockey Fridays with you in the near future. All right, we'll have to stay tuned and uh, definitely we'll circle back once we we hear some more uh, details on that. I did want to go back, Ty, before we wrap here. Um, You know, I've been reading some of the interviews you've given elsewhere and I've heard you talk about the Challenge Cup. A lot of people uplifting what the WNBA or the NBA have been able to do as far as single site. Now, I know from Shelly Picard, who served as uh, deputy commissioner, that that's not something that the NWHL is necessarily looking to do as far as a single site. But I do wonder if there are things that you've gleaned from other sports that have returned or that are in process of their return. And if there are any things that you think fit the NWHL model. Yeah. So I think that's um, all this all, that's a great question. I think we're just, honestly, we're all in the middle of collectively sitting around the table and trying to figure out um, a lot of different things and objectives and goals. Um, but yeah, we're influenced by what goes on um, exter- externally. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely something that we'll be having discussions about and um, hopefully working collaborative, collaboratively together, figure out, you know, where we're going to, you know, lay out some plans in that regard. So. Excellent. And I said we'd, we'd return back to baseball. I'm a huge baseball fan, so I love bending your ear. The, the MLB um, and, you know, even the minor leagues have definitely um, been impacted by coronavirus and COVID-19. But we are at the World Series. So, I mean, what do you make of, of the product that the MLB was able to put together? And, uh, you know, what excites you about this series between Tampa Bay and, and L.A.? Well, so let me preface it by saying it's very hard for me um, with 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 my my family um, affiliations to ever really publicly say I'm rooting for a team. <laughs> um, I, I have a team. I grew up in New York. OK, so I have a team that I've <laughs> I grew up rooting for. Um, but when I was, you know, with the group on an everyday operation level, we had the Yankees and Tampa Bay and Minnesota Twins as affiliates. Right. So. Um, I will say, uh, based on getting a chance to know Tampa Bay uh, in my career, uh, I'm definitely a huge Tampa Bay fan. So um, would like to see uh, just just based on you know all aspects of baseball, you know budgetary reasons they're coming in um, a little bit of obviously an underdog, but then they just have such a great makeup and they've had it for years. Uh, that front office is amazing. 
Um, and so uh, besides the fact that we had one of their affiliates, um, I would definitely be rooting for them. But Major League Baseball, it's really hard to have fan engagement in a time like this, right? They're really doing some really unique stuff, like the cheering and the booing that they, you know, to try to get fans engaged. I saw some really fun stuff during the season two where they do the, the cutouts of the, I mean, some, some really, really good stuff. And you have to understand, like, that was in short order. Like, to come up with all that creative, um, to try to get fans in, uh, it's just weird, right? You're playing in these giant stadiums and you have, you have to like infuse sound into the, the, the system. It's, it's just a weird time. But I, I do think they've done a fantastic job. Um, and we might be stealing some of their stuff, right? Um, and some of their ideas uh, as we go forward. But who are, you, who, are you, who are you going for? Who are you rooting for? See, I, I tend to lean National League uh, yeah. just because I also have a New York team that I root for. Oh, gosh, for better or worse, mostly worse. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's hard. That's, yeah. that's hard to be a fan these days. <laughs> Wow, that's yeah. dedication, actually. You know, that's I'm loyal, if nothing else. Yeah, that's dedication right there. <laughs> but I, I love what you, you said about Tampa, and obviously they were able to tie up the series, but yeah. I think, um, you know, we'll see. I also, if I'm, if I'm being honest, uh, I, I like to be a little bit petty, and just seeing, you know, Justin Turner just thriving at third base hurts my little heart so much. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy okay. for him. I'm just more mad at. <laughs> yeah, I get you. It's okay to be petty, though. That's fun. That's part of the fandom, right? Like, that's part of the fandom. So no, we could be like that. We can't be like that anywhere else, technically. But we could be like that in sports. Like, <laughs> it's expected. It's expected. You, you you roll with the punches. But no, I think it'll yeah. be a good series. I think you're so right, though, about the Rays. Um, It'll be interesting. I don't know. The Dodgers, obviously, the Kershaw story is getting a lot of play these days. So we'll see yeah. if he can come through. But <laughs> ironically, I, I do always root for the for the uh, financial underdog, right? The big people. <laughs> and, and, and and here I am in New York. Uh, yeah, I'm in New York. Uh, um, <laughs> but I, I always like the scrappy teams that kind of come in on a like, different kind of budget, right? And still make it like successful. So I just... Yeah. Not, I'm not devaluing what, what the clubs that have a lot of, you know, a, a larger payroll have. It's still in, in, incredibly hard to get to a World Series. Um, but I'm, I'm not trying to put my business hat on. It's mostly like my fandom hat, and I would definitely be rooting for Tampa Bay. So. All right. Awesome. Well, we'll see what happens uh, as we speak. Obviously, there's, uh, we have a little bit of a break in the schedule. We would say a travel day, but, you know, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. But um, I'll close with this, Ty. We've, you've given us, you know, just a really great overview and, and some of your expectations. But are there any other things that you want to amplify or, or highlight uh, from our conversation or that you think are important for fans uh, to know as we get ready for, for the NWHL season six? Yeah, I think it's just really important for our, our fan base as they, you know, they've been with us for a while now, right? And so I think it's important for the fans to recognize that it's a really exciting, I know it's COVID and I know it's a pandemic and I know we don't have a season six yet, but it is a really, really exciting time, I think, for the NWHL. When you get a, a, a renewed energy, uh, when you get a recommitment, um, uh, it, it, there's some really dynamite things that can come out of it. If we align this properly um, and strategically going forward with great partners, um, I think from a fan's pr perspective, um, they should be in for the next couple of years for some excitement. Um, you know, the way we want to try to market ourselves going forward to um, in a creative fashion. Um, I, I, I just would like to close it off by saying uh, stay tuned and, and, and kind of ride the excitement along with us. Um, truly believe that without the fans um, that have been existing and of course the fans that we hope to to gain um, the, they are essential to like our lifeline uh, um, in, in, in our success with the league so um, so sit tight hopefully I'll be able to have some uh, some fun news coming out of the gate here I'm, we're trying our best to make that happen um, so yeah. Well, <laughs> fun is good. 
<laughs> yeah, we're looking forward to it. Well, we hope you and your family uh, remain safe and healthy, of course. And, uh, you know, uh, best of luck from uh, day nine through 100 <laughs> and beyond. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully we'll connect again on some, some stuff that starts happening, okay? And Sounds good. I, really I just appre I appreciate your interest and your attention to it. Of course, Most important. of course. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to season six. All right, there you have it, folks. Ty Taminia made her debut on the Founding Four podcast. Now you know it's legit. Now you know it's for real. Founding Four podcast. Well, that's our show. Uh, before I leave you, though, I said I was going to give some PWHPA news. And this is kind of big. It's big to the tune of $1 million dollars given to the PWHPA by Secret Deodorant. And Secret is going to be the lead sponsor for the PWHPA Dream Gap Tour 2020-2021, probably 2021. Um, and we also got some news, and Michelle J actually was keeping her eye on Twitter handles the other day. Um, we got some news that the rosters for the regional hubs have been named. So go check out the Ice Garden. They have a, a great spreadsheet. You can, it's even searchable. That's how I found out Blake Bolden was not on that roster. But I've reached out to the PWHPA because I had some questions about the announcement, about um, kind of how the breakdown of the money is going to go. So not only is Secret donating, I believe it's a donation, $1 million, but there's going to be uh, as part of the Dream Gap Tour, the Secret Cup. So there's going to be a reward um, and a championship of sorts to play for. So I'm trying to get figures as far as how much a player can stand to make in one Dream Gap cycle, if you will. I uh, want to know a few more details about the Secret Cup, but also if you check out the new PWHPA handles, you'll see that the logos have specific colors so i'm thinking that each region has its own team color so that might mean new pwhpa uniforms and eh? and eh? um but that and more i will dive into that next week on the founding four podcast if you're not already subscribed go ahead and as they say on youtube smash that subscribe button go ahead and smash the subscribe button burr, 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 burr. um or you can lightly, lightly tap it is fine either way. Just want to make sure that you're subscribed so that you get the notification anytime a new episode comes, uh, or anytime a new episode uploads, I should say. Same goes for Sports Talk ELA on YouTube. I actually posted this interview on YouTube first. I was waiting on the information I wanted to give for the, the audio podcast, the update on the Boston Pride. So I waited a little bit later in the day. But this interview with Ty Timinia went up earlier this morning um, on Sports Talk ELA. And as I mentioned, five of these questions were featured in the nine newsletter. So lots of different ways to keep up, not just with women's sports, but my coverage of women's sports. So I hope you'll do that. Follow at founding for pod for this podcast, um, at sports underscore talk underscore ELA that's on Instagram and also on Twitter. And of course you can follow me personally at E Lindsay zero Eight. That's E L I N D S A Y zero eight. Until next week, and I have a lot of work to do getting some answers about that PWHPA Dream Gap Tour. But until next week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you. Well, you'll hear me on the next episode of the Founding Four podcast. Bye bye.